President Sybil Shepherd. How yeah. are you? Hello what there. a great pleasure. Well, it's nice to see you. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. thrilling. I'm so happy to be here. I'd like you to meet my daughter, Clementine. And this is my husband, Bruce Oppenheimer. Hello, very nice to see you. And my shy daughter, Clementine. Hi, Clementine. My darling nice Clementine. Well, I think we all already, <laughs> yeah, now why don't you come there and we get a family picture. That's great. She wanted to know how people were going to believe that she'd really been here with you. I said, well, they'll take a picture and you can show. Everybody's looking here for one. Thank you, Thank now you I have a case so I want much. to take up with you. Now it's a missing person, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're serious, husband. We're not, we don't uh, pick up again for next season. They have to settle the writer's strike. Oh, it's still, that's still, still going on. on. Yeah, so oh, I don't gosh. have a TV show until they settle that and start writing some scripts. <laughs> anyway, this is really exciting. It's really a pleasure well, to be here. Well, it's nice to see you. So you see you here too. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Thank you thank so you much. much. It's a great pleasure. Well, it's, a pleasure. it's a great pleasure for me, and I'm expected also. Oh, I'm absolutely thrilled. I just seeing you on that box. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate well, it. It's a can great you, pleasure. Can you say goodbye? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so right. much. Say, come in just a second. Why not? Just to teach you a little history. What? Here. Well, you see that thing on the floor, and up above it, that is the great American seal, the national seal. And if you notice that the eagle in the middle has in his claws on that side an olive branch, which means peace. And on this side, arrows, which mean war. Mm. And then if you look over at that old desk, oh, yeah. which goes way back in years, the eagle is looking at the claw with the arrows. Mm. And it wasn't until after World War II that President Truman had the seal changed with the eagle, eagle looking toward the olive branch instead. That's beautiful. Well, I'm Sometimes glad they class. You can confound them if you know that you Yeah, they'll never know that. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Gosh, I'm, I'm a chiropractor from LA, and I, I would have to ask you if you want an adjustment. Before. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I will tell you? Your manicurist, her name is Rose. Yes. Last name is Rose. Her, her son, Kenneth, is one of my best friends, and he's a chiropractor. We went to school together. Well, for heaven's sake. I know why. Where did you go to school? Because, well, I, I went to Los Angeles College of Chiropractic. Oh. Okay. Because I, for some years, was an employee of B.J. Palmer. I know, that was your first Congress. job. That's right, that's right, on WHO Radio. <laughs> See, I remember that. And W.O.C. Davenport, yeah. right. which was in the Palmer School of Chiropractic. Right, right. And W.O.C. stood for World of Chiropractic. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I can believe that. Tell him who signed your diploma. You signed my diploma from college. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it was before it was Cal State Northridge. It was Valley um, State. Right. Yeah, in 19... I guess 60, it was 1970. Mm. Well, that was good. That's right. <laughs> Done well. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You very it was much. a great pleasure. Nice to see you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Enchanté, je suis très heureux. Enchanté. Ken, do you know the president? Monsieur le président? Ken Duberstein. Très enchanté, le président. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just telling them to do one way of 
Oui, hein, exactement. Yes, exactly. Exactement, Et quel est votre statut Maison Blanche ou de Paris What are you, from the White House or the State Department <laughs> Chet Crocker's just back from uh, Zaire about two weeks ago. Mr. Crocker, what I should remember my French that I had studied in school. He wrote the French that I had studied in school. 18 months ago, Mr. President, you told me that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, never, I've never understood exactly how much English the President of Zaire speaks or understands. I think quite a bit. I do understand a few words. I once tracked you when I was governor, a whole group of Soviet press who were speaking to me through the Turkish. Uh, <laughs> then I got suspicious that maybe they understood more English than they were letting me know. Et puis ensuite, je me suis dit qu'il devait comprendre un peu plus d'anglais qu'il me le faisait. I suspect we've met before. <laughs> Nice to see you. George Ward. Hello there. I'm Randy Jones from Gunnersville, Alabama. Well, good to see you. Nice to see you, sir. You do cover the nation so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Mary Nelson from Chicago. Hello there. Good nice to be to here. See you. That was kind of home territory. <laughs> right on. Okay. Mr. And you know that I, know that you're all part of, you're all teammates, so <laughs> I am too, Mr. President. How are you? <laughs> you sneaked in. It's an honor, Mr. President. And we've, we've said hello already. Mr. President, Don. Hello there. My name is Mr. President. Well, please. We call that a wave. <laughs> sometimes there's three or four waves. And part of the Oval Office went sometime back with the Japanese Prime Minister. And the three waves, and they kept coming in, and he just sat there as if he was paralyzed. And when it was over, I found out why. He was counting the Japanese cameras. Well, thank you. Well, as you can see, my 
I'm holding my hands. I've got some remarks to make here, other than the informal. But I uh, want to thank you all and welcome you all to the, to the White House. And by the way, the room that we're in now is called the Roosevelt Room. It was named after the Republican President, Teddy Roosevelt. And on the other hand, if you come here during the last administration, uh, they'd have told you that the room is named after the Democratic President. <laughs> The truth, of course, is that the Roosevelt Room is named after both Roosevelts, Teddy and Franklin alike. And uh, I'd like to point out that the Roosevelt family brought that in and gave it to us to have in this room. That is the Nobel Peace Award that Teddy Roosevelt won for settling the Russo-Japanese War. And sometimes with the right audience in here, I like to point out that he did it in what most people would say was typical Republican style. He was sitting on a yacht at the time. <laughs> Seriously, I've always liked the, the idea that right here at the very center of the West Wing, where so many important decisions are made, is a powerful reminder that being a Republican or a Democrat takes second place to being an American. Right. Amen. That's right. That's an especially appropriate thought, given the nature of our meeting here today. We're the welfare reform affects us all, regardless of party. And the need to involve the private sector in this great effort is not a need of this or that group, but a need of the entire nation. And it's a need that could hardly be more pressing. I've often said that when the federal government declared war on poverty, poverty won. The federal government saw 59 <laughs> major welfare programs costing more than $100 billion a year. But there's good evidence that this federal money has only made dependency harder to escape. I've always believed that the key to reducing dependency and poverty lies in reaching out, out from Washington to the states and communities. And one of my biggest difficulties is getting Congress to believe this. Once again, Congress is about to vote on legislation that compounds and continues the failures of the past. The bill before the Senate and similarly flawed legislation already passed for the House of Representatives spends billions to expand a welfare system that hasn't worked. They do not require able-bodied welfare recipients to perform any work or community service, which is essential, I think, to welfare reform. In addition, these bills fail to show confidence in your abilities by excluding the broad waiver authority <coughs> necessary for the full implementation of state and community-based reforms. Mm -hmm. You can rest assured that I continue to favor welfare reform, but welfare expansion of the type now under consideration in Congress will meet, meet with a veto. Yes. I should quit right there. But <laughs> As our administration has given the 50 states more flexibility, the states have responded, demonstrating, for example, that we can have more effective child support informant practices, that we can have welfare systems that provide genuine job training, that we can have welfare programs that give the welfare recipients one of the highest forms of dignity known to man, the dignity of working for what they receive. And while I'm mentioning the innovations we've seen in the states, I want to commend Governor Tom Kane and Mayor William Morris under their leadership. The state of New Jersey and Shelby County, Tennessee have been at the very forefront of these innovations. But the private sector has a role to play here as well, and that should come as no surprise. Once we get our hands off big government for just a moment, we can see that Americans have always been generous, always concerned about helping their neighbors. And indeed, during the economic expansion of the past six years, we've seen private donations to charity go up. Today, charitable giving in America is running at a rate 77% higher than that of just eight years ago. It shows what the private sector can do when government restrains itself so the economy can grow. And last year alone, the funds raised for various worthwhile causes came to an historic $84 billion biggest amount ever in our history. 
but the money itself, whether from government or private sources, is of no use unless there are more and more people like you, people who understand what it takes to escape dependency and are willing to lend a helping hand to others. I couldn't possibly recognize all the good work that your conference here represents. I've just been hearing more about the innovative ideas Don Krebs has come up with, and there's the wonderful organization called Helping Ourselves Means Education, and those letters spell home, founded by Carol Sasaki, once a single mother on welfare. Home has helped thousands of Americans in need come to understand the importance of education and the self-esteem and success it fosters in leading people to independent and productive lives. There's the job training for hundreds of National Women's Employment and Education Incorporated. In 1985 alone, this program, headed by Lupe Anguiano, saw more than 70 women where... <laughs> The sign was too close. <laughs> well, women apparently trapped forever in welfare dependency find jobs and become self-supporting. And there's Kimmy Gray and her college Here We Come program. Kimmy was raised right here in Washington. She had a rough childhood. By the time she was only 19, she was on welfare and the mother of five. Today, she's a nationally recognized leader in the movement for resident management of public housing. And listen to this. Back in the mid-1970s, the housing development Kimmy herself lived in was breeding a high school dropout rate of 80%, in large part because of her efforts. Today, 80% of the development's young people are completing high school, and 30% are going on to college. So I think you will agree, government programs and money can't solve problems by themselves. What's needed is people, committed people. People like Don, Kimi, Lupe, Carol. People like all of you. I want you to know that you have my support, and I think you've guessed that, and my appreciation, and I'm looking forward to receiving your recommendations on promoting self-sufficiency by harnessing the genius of self-help. Millions of Americans, you're pointing the way to a better future, the future of education, prosperity and perhaps the most valuable commodity of all, self-respect. And I thank you all and God bless you all. And Kimi, having talked about you, I thought maybe you might have something to add right here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. President, so a few words. Last year when I had an opportunity to sit before you, I explained very clearly that what we had done is we reduced our welfare recidivism from 87% to 35%. But this year, that's been reduced to 2%. But the ultimate goal for our community now is to purchase our housing development. Because also we know one of the goals of this administration, and we intend to be the first person we'd we'll like to do it this year if possible, have you turned the key to us. But one of the things we wanted to clearly make uh, clear today was that HUD needs to fully understand that there are no options to the regulations they are writing now for the local housing authorities to provide to the for HUD to provide the local housing authorities. Right now they do not understand that they need to abide by the housing laws and regulations. Right now, they are writing against us and writing in favor of us. If you can possibly assist us with that, Mr. President, then all our goals will be reached. Home ownership, reducing welfare, recidivism, and all. And we hope that you can assist us in that, Mr. President. Well, I'd like to very much. The first glimpse I ever saw of that, believe it or not, was in that city, nation, Singapore. And I think that to leave Kwan Yu, Prime Minister there is one of the world's great statesmen. And he took me on a tour and he showed me, yes, they had public housing. And it looked so neat and clean and mowed and everything. And he said, told, told me, he said, well, we don't mind building it, but we don't like being the landlord. So he said, we've done everything we can to make it possible for the tenants to buy their units, even to the point of allowing them to use their future social security as a, a means of getting, getting a mortgage, that they could use that as a, to, to justify it and so forth, but make it possible, whatever is needed, to get them to be the owners. And the result was just what you found yourself, that once someone does own that place, 
And they had a pretty good security also in case someone uh, wanted to pull something and sell. Once you bought it and owned it, became a property owner. If you ever sold it, you were ineligible for public housing. Yeah. <laughs> but then you were a property owner. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> President, they've been tapping on my shoulder on your behalf. I'll help Kimmy with that. And, uh, uh, it's, we really appreciate your going from summit to summit this way. I appreciate all of your comments. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You. Well, listen, thank, thank you. you Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. jokes that I, from the Soviet Union, <laughs> before I was there, jokes that I find they're telling. And this one was one that was told to me after we got back by one of our Secret Service agents. Their story is that Gorbachev and I were in a limousine with my Secret Service man and his KGB man, and he was shut sightseeing, and he stopped and showed us a great waterfall. And uh, we all got out and were looking, and then he said to my agent, go ahead, jump over. <laughs> And my agent said, I've got a wife and three kids. And uh, so he turned to his man and said, jump over. And his man jumped. <laughs> well, our man went scrambling down around the falls, the rocks, to get down there and find out what happened. Found him down there wringing out his clothes. And he said, look, when he told you to do that, why did you jump? He says, I've got a wife and three kids. <laughs> is not for the purpose of the heads uh, to focus on their own economies, but really to fund market-oriented economic policies that uh, you brought to the table in 1981 and 1982, uh, and that were basically derided at the time. I remember it. I know you remember it. Uh, there wasn't anybody there with us uh, in, in 1981, and now uh, they're falling all over themselves to follow you. And I think uh, you can't say that, but hopefully uh, some of the others will. Uh, I think it's the view, Alan has been in, in uh, these Sherpa meetings up there, it's the view of the Canadians that they'd like to have that result. But the one the things you can talk about are those, some of those very same policies, deregulation, tax reform, reduced government spending. Uh, then it seemed to me it would be appropriate for you to talk uh, a little bit about